Joining me now are uh, all the way from Athens, Greece via Zoom is Professor Yanis Varoufakis. He was the former Greece finance minister back in 2015. Professor, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to join me in order to share your ideas on, 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 on the economic crisis here in Sri Lanka. Now, currently, you know what's happening in, in, in this nation. Um, with regard to our economy, all hopes and advice by think tanks in Colombo are um, telling us um, and I have to also told the government to go to the IMF and now we are at a point of no return on those negotiations. We're pretty much, you know, wrapping up the deal for that. You tweeted advising Sri Lanka to refrain from going to the IMF. Why is that? And if that's your point of view, what's the best way forward for us? Pain is unavoidable when you go bankrupt. There's no doubt about that. There are no easy solutions. Anybody who promises the good people of Sri Lanka an easy solution is a charlatan and should be completely and utterly ignored. Yeah? Uh, however, there is a profound difference between pain, which is a, an investment into future prosperity, and pain, which is a pointless investment into more pain, if you understand what I'm saying. To use a medical language or parallel that, um, you know, People in the financial sector use often uh, when they refer to the IMF's policies. When the IMF comes to a place like Greece, a place like Sri Lanka, a place like Argentina, a place like, like the United Kingdom, don't forget that the United Kingdom sought the help of the IMF in 1976, for those who, <laughs> whose memories goes, go that long back. Um, the standard argument is that, okay, the IMF is like the doctor who comes to uh, deliver um, a bitter medicine, which nevertheless is essential for you to recover. Well, if that were the case, I would be all for embracing the assistance, in inverted commas, of the IMF. Bitter medicine sometimes is essential for recovery, for a cure, right? Uh, but if you look at what the IMF did to South Korea in 1998, uh, to um, a, a score of African countries in the 1970s to my country in to, between 2010 and 2015, 2016, 2018. You see that- If, if I'm man, not uh, uh, mistaken, uh, the IMF apologized for wrong policy uh, uh, movement in your country. Yep, they did. And I have spoken to many good people in the IMF who have um, acknowledged that in every one of those countries that I mentioned just now, the IMF has been toxic. So, so there's a fundamental difference between, between bitter medicine and a toxic drug that actually kills the patient or makes the patient far worse. Hmm? So this is what the, uh, 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 I'm very keen that your people do not uh, swallow uh, toxic waste thinking that it was bitter but effective medicine. This is, you know, this is the main concern that I have. Uh, and, okay, look, I'm not saying you shouldn't talk to the IMF, but to imagine that a loan from the IMF is necessarily going to be the solution to the problems that Sri Lanka is facing is simply to fly in the face of historical fact. Look at Argentina. You know, 20 years ago, the IMF committed a crime against the people of Argentina. It was a pure, unadulterated an adulterated crime against the people of Argentina. They gave a very large, uh, very large multi-billion dollar loan to the government of Argentina to facilitate what? To facilitate the conversion of the profits of the oligarchs and some corporations from the local currency to, to American dollars so that the few oligarchs could take their money out of Argentina before Argentina collapsed, and the good people who didn't benefit from this IMF loan would then owe the money to the IMF. They did this 20 years ago. And they did it again five years ago. They did exactly the same thing in the same country. So you know, the fact that the IMF apologizes here and there means nothing. They are constantly repeating the same logic of first a loan that most of it is not going to go to the people of Sri Lanka. It's going to go to creditors who should yes. not get their money back. Because let me be absolutely clear. 
to anyone who points the finger at you, and I'm now addressing the people of Sri Lanka, anybody from the West who says to you, oh, you've been very naughty, you've borrowed a lot of money, now you can't repay it, and you are ethically responsible. My answer to them would be, it takes two to tango. For every irresponsible borrower, there is an irresponsible creditor. Exactly. When the banks were giving away all those mo monies to you know, shadowy characters in Sri Lanka, uh, on behalf of the Sri Lankan people, uh, they were responsible for the predatory loans they were making. So the creditors of Sri Lanka must bear a very significant proportion of the cost of the bankruptcy of Sri Lanka. Anyone who Absolutely. tries, and especially the continue, IMF, continue, trying to continue. Especially the IMF that always takes the side of the creditors has to be told by the government of Sri Lanka that the first, the prerequisite for any debate, any discussion with Sri Lanka, with Sri Lanka between Sri Lanka and the International Monetary Fund must be an acknowledgement by the International Monetary Fund that there will have to be a very significant debt reduction, a haircut. Creditors must accept that they will not get their money back. They will, will get back a small proportion of the money they lend. Because if your government commits your people to, to pay a large percentage of an unpayable debt. Hmm? An unpayable debt cannot be paid. So the only way of pretending that you will be paying it is by imposing taxation that is so high that you will kill off the, you know, the goose that lays the eggs. It will kill off the economic activity from which you would have to generate the income in order to make sure that your people can survive and that you pay your debts. So the first, the prerequisite for any deal with any creditor and the international fund, monetary fund, must be a very significant haircut. The second prerequisite must be that no austerity, that the logic of reducing the debt and the budget deficit based on spending cuts spending cuts at a time when the Sri Lankan domestic private sector is massively reducing its expenditure because of the crisis, to introduce public sector spending cuts is, is, is madness. Because it's not like a shop. Sri Lanka is not a shop. It is not a family. You and I, Professor, if we have a family. Now, let me ask you about Greece per se. Now, when you were the Minister of Finance, the Greek economy collapsed and you were used as the scapegoat, uh, whereas decisions made eons ago contributed to this fact. Uh, in your assessment, sir, what was the biggest key factor that led to the collapse and what kind of similarities do you see between the uh, Greek economy and the Sri Lankan economy? Let me begin by a small correction. Uh, in terms of the causality, the direction of causality. Uh, I was not uh, a minister uh, before the collapse happened. I became a minister because the collapse happened and because the IMF uh, and the rest of Greece's creditors behaved abominably for a number of years. Greece collapsed in 2010. Uh, between 2010 and 2015, Greece followed an international monetary fund uh, designed program, which was catastrophic. The people of the IMF admitted that. It's not just me saying so. And in 2015, there was an election uh, which the party that I was with at the time uh, won government and I became finance minister. So this this is just, just to put the record straight. Uh, I think the, 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 there is a, an interesting uh, parallel between Sri Lanka today and Greece back then despite the fact, the obvious fact, that there are very large differences between our two countries. And the parallel from which I think the good people of Sri Lanka must draw lessons is the following. In uh, 2010, what happened here in Greece was that the world economy, uh, global capitalism, to put it simply, went through a majestic, a remarkable, um, once in a lifetime 
or maybe two lifetimes uh, spasm that was the 2008 great financial catastrophe across the Western world. And the shockwaves of that global crisis, global crash, uh, eventually uh, toppled a number of entities. You may recall, those of you who are old enough to recall, that uh, Dubai, the yeah. small city-state of Dubai, was the first one to go bankrupt after the banks of America, of the United Kingdom, of Germany, of France had been toppled. It was Dubai that was the first state to have gone bankrupt and essentially had to be bailed out by Saudi Arabia. And then immediately after that, it was the state of Greece. So a global financial crisis, a global crisis, it creates a tsunami. The weakest states and companies and banks begin to fail one after the other. Greece was the, the state with the largest debt that was toppled immediately after that. The IMF comes in and um, orchestrates a loan under conditions that guaranteed the further depression and the further humiliation of the people of Greece. The comparison with Sri Lanka is this. Uh, following that catastrophe of 2008, 2009, 2010, in the West, we had 12 years between 2008 and the pandemic, 12 years of a very silly policy. <laughs> what is the silly policy that I'm referring to? Uh, for 12 years, the central banks of the West, of the United States, the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Bank of Switzerland, the Bank of Sweden, the Bank of Japan, and so on, they were printing huge quantities of money to refloat the financial sector, the banks that had gone um, bankrupt back in 2008 for 12 years. At the very same time, the governments of those nations, of these countries, were imposing strict austerity, universal austerity, on the majority of people in all these countries. And the result was that you had huge quantity of money in the financial sector and very low levels of uh, demand, investment, consumer spending, in the economy at large, in the real economy of the West. Uh, that created a permanent deflation, permanent stagnation between 2009, let's say, and 2020. Then you had the pandemic. Central banks started printing even more money to support businesses and individuals during the pandemic. And it is at that time that because supply was interrupted so severely, you have demand increasing a little bit because of the central bank money that was reaching this time for the first time, the many, the multitudes, demand was going up, supply crashed catastrophically because of lockdowns and supply chain disruption that in introduced inflation, started pushing up energy prices. The moment that happens, Sri Lanka, which is the weakest link in this new cycle, is the one that becomes bank bankrupt as a result of the rise of the dollar, and the rise of energy, and given that you had to use dollars in order to pay for, for, for your energy, your country, which had, as a result of mismanagement by your government, uh, been, you, you found yourselves in the situation where we were in 2010. The country with um, a, a currency issue, balance of payments problem, in the midst of a global maelstrom caused by the failures of um, Western capitalism. And now you have exactly the same situation where we had in 2010, the IMF visiting you, pointing fingers of accusation at the good yeah, people of yeah. Sri Lanka saying it was all your fault. It wasn't your fault. It was the fault of the global capital system and previous governments, exactly. which most people in Sri Lanka were not supporting, and trying to impose upon you a, a path um, a series of policies which are not going to deliver you from the present crisis in which you find yourselves. Uh, perhaps I, I really want to dive uh, deep into that. I, I want you to hold that thought. Uh, uh, we want to take a short commercial break. Uh, we're going to um, come back uh, right uh, back and we'll try to uh, dive deep into that uh, subject which we are talking about. I'm in conversation with uh, Professor Yanis Varoufakis, the former Finance Minister of Greece from uh, tw in, in 2015. Uh, we'll be right back and watch instead of it.
Welcome back everyone to State of the Nation. I'm in conversation with the uh, former Finance Minister of Greece, uh, Professor Yanis Varoufakis. We've been talking about uh, the, Greece's dealings with the IMF. Uh, if you all study the history a little bit, Greece too went to the IMF and they got a really bad deal, which uh, eventually um, ended up being paid by the citizens of Greece going through so much of hardships. And here we are at uh, the beginning of some what of the same cycle here in Sri Lanka at the moment. We are going through a, a economic hardship and we are looking at the IMF as our own um, savior. Uh, Minister, uh, for Minister, I, I want to start off uh, this segment asking you, uh, what would you have done differently if by any chance you were given the opportunity to do this again? If there is a repeat, uh, what would you do differently? I would actually do what I tried to do, because remember, I came in at the end of the crisis. Uh, I um, tried to, to negotiate with the IMF. Um, I even stopped payments to the IMF in order to make sure to, to signal to Washington DC that um, their policies uh, were catastrophic for my country. And we clashed, we clashed. We had an almighty clash in 2015 to the extent that um, I left the government when my prime minister succumbed and signed another deal with the IMF. Uh, to, to give you an idea, uh, we went bankrupt because we had a debt of about 300 billion euros. Okay. Yeah. Uh, today, as we speak, we have a debt of 100 billion. Our income back then, when we became bankrupt, was 240 billion. Today is less than 200. So you can see the kind of destruction that the IMF has left behind. And it's very important that Sri Lanka learns from that lesson. Stop thinking of the IMF as your savior. The IMF is not your savior. The IMF is your potential destroyer. So put this in your head. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk to them because they are a very important international organization. Maybe they've learned their lesson, but for Sri Lanka to get, to get something decent, a decent deal out of the IMF, there are two prerequisites. The first one, there has to be a massive reduction in your debt before you borrow a penny. Don't borrow any money from the IMF before there is an international agreement with your bankers, whether they are European, American or Chinese of significantly refusing, uh, uh, reducing the debt because you will not be able to pay it, hmm? even if you borrow, <laughs> especially if you borrow. And especially if you borrow under conditions, and that's the second condition, the second prerequisite of austerity, of fiscal austerity. If the IMF makes it a condition that the, your government should reduce massively spending at the time when your private sector is already reducing spending, private expenditure, private investment massively because of the crisis. What is the sum of private and public expenditure? It's your national income. Your national income is going to go further down if your government agrees to austerity imposed by the IMF. Where is your repayments going to come from to the IMF if your national income carries on shrinking? These are the two conditions. Debt restructure, debt reduction, and secondly, no fiscal austerity. If the IMF is not prepared to grant you that, no deal should be signed between the government of Sri Lanka and the IMF. I, I'm sadly to say, I think we've passed that uh, uh, no turning back point at the moment with the dealings with the IMF because I think they basically have dictated all of that and we know that there's going to be um, you know, very painful austerity measures which will be implemented as we move on in the next uh, few months and people of this country will start feeling the, the hammer down, the IMF hammer coming really hardly down on them and this could actually lead towards some kind of another societal uh, unrest. Uh, I, I believe it could happen. Uh, but then again, we have to wait and see. One uh, good thing you uh, touched on, uh, Professor, which I want to get your take as well, because we see the similarities of that. Uh, do you see that a, a dealing of an invisible hand, so to speak, uh, that has pushed uh, us into this situation, especially Sri Lanka, and pushed you uh, into that situation, uh, regional powers, Western powers, trying to play their political games, and you becoming the scapegoat or, or, or the, 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 the ground where they actually start their fight or, or you know, sort it out. 
We see there is this push between uh, the West and China. Uh, Sri Lanka is right in the middle. That geopolitics has been quite crucial in terms of how we handle our political uh, uh, economy, rather, to say. Uh, do you see that kind of a thing taking center stage and something that we are not actually looking into and we should be aware of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, when Greece went bankrupt in 2010, I really simply refused to believe that anybody, anybody thought that we could repay the loans that the IMF and the European Central Bank and the European Union gave us, supposedly to save us. I don't think that anybody was idiotic enough to believe that it was possible to repay those loans under conditions of fiscal austerity. So the question is, why did they do it? Well, the answer is all around me here in Greece today. Let me give you an example. 14 of our most lucrative and profitable airports, including the airport in the island of Mykonos, the island of Sardorini, you know, these are very rich islands in terms of international tourism. Um, you know, a, a room uh, for the night in Mykonos costs more than a thousand dollars more than a thousand dollars, even the cheapest room. So you imagine what kind of earning capacity the airport of Mykonos has. Huh? Those 14 airport, airports were given for free to foreign interests, to a German company, for free, just take them. Um, to introduce a geopolitical dimension, a couple of years after the last deal, which I refused to sign and therefore I resigned in 2015, uh, we have a port in the north of Greece, um, the, in the town of Alexandrupolis, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a port very close to Turkey, very close to Bulgaria, a stone's throw from Ukraine and Russia, really. This port now and its airport are essentially part of the United States Army Navy and Air Force, and it's being used as um, um, a stopover for supplies to the war happening to our north. So here is the answer as to how could they possibly not know that by imposing severe austerity upon us and not agreeing to a debt restructure, a rational debt restructure. Didn't they know that they wouldn't get their money back? The answer was actually given to me by Amartya Sen, the famous Indian Nobel Prize winner in economics, when he said to me, Yanis, look, the problem you had when you were finance minister is that you were negotiating with people who didn't really care to take their money back. What they cared about was a new kind of imperialism. This is what I'm adding. I think this is not what Amartya Sen said. But, you know, that's the essence of it. Debt it, eh, that you owe to powerful interests is huge geopolitical power over you. So this is why the government of Sri Lanka would be very remiss to strike this deal with the IMF mm. that makes Sri Lanka, turns your country effectively into a debt colony. A debt colony, as you put it very succinctly and correctly, caught between West and East. Sri Lanka should belong to the people of Sri Lanka. Your fate should be your fate to deal with, to manage. Uh, there's something far worse than not getting a loan from the IMF under those conditions, and that is getting it. Mm. What would happen if you didn't take the loan from the IMF? You would go bankrupt. Well, good. Go bankrupt officially, embrace your bankruptcy and pick yourselves up from the bootstraps and start from scratch. This is far better than being permanently indebted to an IMF and to creditors that will turn your country in, again in a colony that is permanently bankrupt. Because in the end, the worst fate that can befall Sri Lanka is for young people to leave the country in droves because that is the most important capital that you have for the future. Sadly, uh, even though that is the bitter pill which we need to swallow, um, I don't think uh, in, in the recent future we will ever be able to do that because I think we're way too 
uh, deep into this crisis uh, we're just looking at for a quick fix. And just like you said, uh, we need to start from scratch. And, and that is a commitment that people of Sri Lanka needs to strong handedly, um, um, intelligently look at rather than being uh, victims of, of, of someone else and or some nefarious agenda and start screaming and shouting and blaming everyone else. I think, um, like you said, uh, Professor, the, the decision is, is with us in order to create a Sri Lanka that is better for us. Thank you very much, Professor Yanis uh, Warufakis. Thank you very much uh, for your time. I certainly appreciate and um, being um, you being kind enough to share your ideas with our audience i will be right back with professor gigi foster this is state of the nation